I'm Elizabeth Lang, and I teach some classes for adults at St. Michael and All Angels in Dallas, Texas. I'm speaking today about William Stringfellow, an Episcopalian, a lay theologian whose spirituality and theology impelled him to write and work on behalf of social justice, especially in the 1960s and 1970s. To understand Stringfellow, it's helpful to remember his historical context. The divisions, turbulence, and violence associated with the civil rights movement. Recall nonviolent protests met with brutality. Remember black power, riots, and burning in urban ghettos. This was followed by further polarization of our country, a major split over whether the Vietnam War was just or necessary. More protests, TV images of killings. Families as well as citizens were deeply divided on what was patriotic or right. I was a student at Cornell during this time, and I went to hear William Stringfellow preach. How many of you can remember a sermon heard over 50 years ago? Well, maybe you're too young for that. How about a sermon heard 40 years ago? Or 30? Or 20? Would you believe 10? I remember the sermon. Stringfellow spoke quietly, deliberately, but his words and intensity, it was like a laser. I encountered a prophet. Now keep in mind, when you're thinking of William Stringfellow, keep in mind Bill Powers' definition of a prophet. A prophet is someone you invite to dinner once. William Stringfellow preached on the raising of Lazarus. You remember the story. Jesus called Lazarus from out of a tomb. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. In response, the religious authorities started their plot to kill Jesus. They did so because Jesus publicly demonstrated his authority over the powers of death. This ascendancy over death, said Stringfellow, is terrifying to all authorities, states, and empires, because ultimately their power to rule rests on the power of death. They had to get rid of this man who transcended the moral and political sanction of the state. Jesus didn't die as a passive victim. He was a threat. So, the political powers cooperated to execute Christ as a criminal. But death does not win. God's power, shown by the resurrection, defeats and triumphs over death. While not everyone heard the sermon the same way I did, I spoke with Bill Stringfellow about a dozen years later and told him that his sermon had a great effect on me. He chuckled and said not everyone heard it the same way. He was invited to a luncheon with the board of trustees of Cornell and their spouses. And when he walked into the room, a woman walked up to him and started beating him on the chest. So obviously, not everyone responds to Stringfellow the same way.
You can hear brings Bill Stringfellow as that woman did, or as I did. But listen, Stringfellow was on a panel in Chicago at which the famous theologian Karl Barth was present. And this was Barth's only trip to America. Stringfellow was the one person on the panel whom Karl Barth looked at and commanded, listen to this man. So I urge you to listen to what Stringfellow has to say to us in this troubled time. Stringfellow's major work theologically is on what the New Testament calls the principalities and powers, or systemic evil. To clarify and simplify, the principalities and powers are creatures that share our fallen state. The fall does not extend merely to humans, but to all of creation, including these principalities and powers. These powers diminish, demean, dehumanize, and destroy. You can see them in the form of ideologies, idols, and institutions. Ideologies include such systems as communism, capitalism, pacifism, racism, sexism, nationalism, militarism, professionalism. You get the idea. When Stringfellow spoke at the Education Hour at the Episcopal Church of Cornell, lots of people showed up, many of whom I had not seen in church. Mostly they were students who were opposed to the Vietnam War, and many of these were very attracted to Marxism. Stringfellow knew his audience. Right at the start, he attacked Marxism as one of the principalities and powers. Only the gospel of Christ, he said, was liberating. Idols are another form that the principalities and powers take. For example, we live in a consumer society which holds up images of what we are supposed to be. A, prim a prominent idol is status, whether through possessions or profession. Wealth becomes a way of defining persons. This traps us and sets up destructive comparisons, or as Stringfellow said, where money is an idol, to be poor is a sin. Institutions are inhabited by the principalities and powers. I'll list a few and you'll get the idea. Bureaucracies, ecclesiastical structures, corporations, labor unions, political parties, hospitals, technology, the military-industrial complex, and especially the state. Stringfellow's not gloomy. He said no to the fallen principalities and powers of death because he said yes to the creative power of life. Life opposes and defeats the powers of death. Life is the word of God. Now Stringfellow on the word of God, well, he's got many, a many layered concept. Um, first of all, Stringfellow is not a fundamentalist, but he sees the word of God revealed in the Bible, in creation, in salvation history, and in the anticipation of the climax and end of the world. And he sees the Bible and the word of God in the Bible as political. 
The word of God is incarnate in Christ. Manifest and active in Christ in the world. The word of God is like a verb. It's a powerful energy. And the word of God comes at us from the future to meet us. Well, let's turn away from abstractions to story. To quote Bill Stringfellow, biography is theology. After serving in the armed forces, Stringfellow entered and graduated from Harvard Law School in the 1950s. Then he bemused his family and friends by going to work for Negroes, as they were politely, politely called then, and Latinos in Harlem, New York City. There he learned experientially about systemic evil. He practiced law as an advocate for the dispossessed and the disadvantaged by taking on bureaucracies, corrupt officials, profit-driven utility companies, rapacious landlords, the courts. He began by working for an interdenominational Christian group serving the poor. He resigned from that agency because its stress on social action diluted the centrality of Bible study, which Stringfellow deemed essential. He continued his advocacy through law. He was accepted by his Harlem neighbors because he accepted them. For example, he described one of the residents of Harlem as an unemployed drug addict whom he invited to his apartment once a week to take a shower. He said that he wished this man, Stringfellow said, he wished this man were not an addict. He, Stringfellow, was not an addict. Nevertheless, Christ loved this unemployed addict with the grace and favor that was the same as the love and grace and favor that he extended to Stringfellow. To me, this seems like St. Francis embracing the leper. Known for his theological writings, Stringfellow was invited to universities and seminaries to lecture. He thought that many seminary theologians were too academic, too speculative. They were not serving Christians in the world. Once, after a lecture, the dean of the seminary told Stringfellow that no responsible theologian would say what Stringfellow had just said. Stringfellow was reassured by this. An individual who had witnessed the exchange sent to Stringfellow a citation from the journals of Kierkegaard, which said substantially what Stringfellow had said. So Stringfellow communicated this to the dean of the seminary, who said Kierkegaard was not a responsible theologian. Stringfellow thought, of course, Stringfellow was not a responsible theologian. He was in the world where the presence of God is, not in the seminary where the theologians are. For health reasons, Stringfellow moved from New York to Block Island, Rhode Island. There, he and Anthony Town practiced a monastic lifestyle. Stability, celibacy, intercession on behalf of the world, 
and constant conversion. It was there that Dan Barrigan, a Jesuit priest, sought sanctuary when Barrigan was being sought by the FBI. Barrigan had been convicted and sentenced to jail for publicly burning draft files with napalm in a prophetic action against the Vietnam War. I think Barrigan's the only preach, priest who was on the FBI's most wanted list. The FBI agents did find Barrigan at the Black, Block Island home, and they took him away. Previously, at a church gathering, during the trial of Dan Barrigan, Stringfellow had said, remember now, the state has only one power it can use against human beings, death. The state can persecute you, prosecute you, imprison you, exile you, and execute you. All of these mean the same thing. The state can consign you to death. The grace of Jesus Christ in this life means that death fails. There's nothing the state can do to you or to me which we need fear. I was with Stringfellow when he was addressing a group on lay ministry when I lived in the Diocese of Southern Ohio. Stringfellow said that his vocation was to be a human being. I was present when someone asked him, given his critique of the legal system, how he practiced law. He replied, with fear and trembling. As an attorney, he was an advocate for those restricted or reduced by fallen systems. He represented poor people, civil rights workers, homosexuals, people accused of heresy, women who sought on ordination. He was a devout Episcopalian who defended the accused in a heresy trial concerning the irregular ordination of women. That's the kind of work he did. I heard him assert that baptism conveys the gifts which empower Christians to live humanely in this world. He said he didn't know what the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit was. But he did know the most frequent sin against the Holy Spirit. It was ingratitude for gifts received. He lived according to his words. The practice of the Christian life consists of the discernment of seeing and hearing and the reliance upon the reckless and uncalculating dependence and the celebration, the ready and spontaneous enjoyment of the presence of the word of God in the common life of the world. He studied the word of God. He meditated on the word of God. He taught the word of God. He preached the word of God. He kept the word of God. And I believe the word of God is keeping him. I want to close with some words that you might find helpful and appropriate for these times of pandemic. Stringfellow said, anxieties do not end in death. Anxieties end in God. I hope that helps you. Thank you.